Good morning, Bridgeway. How are you? Good morning. Welcome to second service. You guys look good. You guys clean up pretty well. I gotta tell you. All right. Well, welcome to second service. We're gonna worship as we normally do. Happy Easter, by the way. He has risen today. Would you stand as we sing together? was redeemed only through believing. My orphan heart was given away. Look why my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, I died. Oh, your grace so She's Rejoiced as the Lord had peace. But then Jesus arose me of freedom in him. That's when death was arrested. Going down 
seat. I'll invite Tommy up for some announcements this morning. Thanks, Tate. Morning. How is everybody? That's a lot of people. Happy Easter. Welcome to Bridgeway. Um, I'm Tommy Webb, if you don't know me. Um, so this morning, I got up here at the earlier service at 9 a.m. I got up here, and the first thing that Brandon said was, show them your socks. Show them your socks. Come on. So uh, can't leave that hanging. I was trying to find socks this morning that matched my, uh, my shirt because you know, we had pictures this morning, so we had to look all spiffy and whatnot. So I don't know if you guys can see them, but these are the Eddie socks. These are my, my uh, guinea pig, Eddie. Yeah. So one day I'll bring in the Aaron socks. That's my wife, Aaron. She got me socks with her face on them. Uh, and I'll wear those one morning so you all can see them. Uh, welcome to Bridgeway for those watching online. Good morning for everyone here. Good morning. If you are a guest here and you're brand new, please fill out our communication card. Rip it off. There's an offering box in the back and one in the new here table. Pins are on the new here table if you need a pin to fill it out. For every communication card we receive, we will give $10 to a Child's Hope International and it feeds a child for a month. What is next? So we have a prayer wall. If you walk out those double doors, go down the hallway to your right, you'll see our big old prayer wall. And there is a spot where you can put a prayer request on the prayer wall. Uh, it can be anonymous. It doesn't have to be anonymous. And then every month during the men's prayer meeting and during the ladies' prayer meeting, which is a week after the men's, uh, we'll collect those prayer requests and we'll pray over them. Also next to it is our pray and go map, which I'll get to in a second. What's next? Free family portrait downstairs. So, yeah, we got family portraits downstairs. Um, so after service today, if you want to get your picture taken, uh, Brianna's taking pictures downstairs in the fellowship hall. That, that's why we're all dressed up. We're in ties. And whatnot. Pray and go. So yesterday was our first uh, pray and go event. And this is for any time. So anybody can do this at any time. But we had our first event yesterday. Uh, some of us met here, then we drove out to Sedona Ridge, met at Prince of Shank Park, and then we went out to Sedona Ridge, and we got about, I think, half of it um, uh, prayed over. So what we did was we split off in two groups, and we prayed over each house uh, throughout Sedona Ridge, and then we hung um, door hangers on the house, just letting those individual family know, individual families know that we prayed over them. And then uh, the goal is so if you look on the prayer wall, you see that you get the church, and then there's a five-mile radius um, around the church. There's 30,000 families in that five-mile radius, 100,000 homes, and the goal is to pray over each and every family. Now, we don't know how long it's going to take. And if you look, which I, I looked after service, first service, there's a little highlight area that we hit yesterday, and there's another one that somebody else hit. Uh, at another time. So at any time, you can go and grab some door hangers. You can grab a piece of paper. That just It's a good advice on how to pray and what to pray over uh, for these families. And you can hit your own street, your own neighborhood, go to another neighborhood, and just pray um, over these families. And that's the goal is to pray over every family in our, in our community. It's men's Bible study this Tuesday at 7 p.m. We are in the book of James. Uh, if you haven't been there, men, uh, Come on down. Uh, we meet in the Fellowship Hall on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. And that is it. If you all don't mind, we'll go ahead and bow our heads and we'll start off with prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for this Easter Sunday where you, where you beat death and you rose from the grave, Lord. Where you forgave us from our sins and uh, you took death away from us, Lord. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for bringing us here together for us being able to gather together. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for being with us. We pray that you continue to be with us today, Lord. We thank you for Pastor Brent as he brings a message, Lord. We pray that you open our hearts and our minds as we listen to him. Thank you so much for all that you do. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship? Thank you. 
This song is a, a great reminder for us, and especially today as we you know, observe Easter together, that, uh, that the, the end is already written. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes the enemy tries to um, get in your head and tell you that you're not good enough or, or, or try and get you on the sidelines. A few weeks ago, Pastor Brent uh, was talking about uh, Christianity is not a spectator sport, um, that we should be on the field playing, and, and really what the devil wants is us to be in the stands and not being effective Christians, and, and so, so this song is a good reminder uh, of kind of putting the devil in his place, kind of reminding him of, of his future, so to speak. Oh, death, where's your boast? Where's your glory? And what of your pretensions have you left? Foolish was your pride and vain ambition. You tried but were found wanting in the end. And all you did was all you could and yet it failed you. Cause Jesus rose and sank you to the grave 
And in resurrection I refuse to fear you. Oh, death, you died, and I'm alive instead. Oh, death, where's your bite? Where's your triumph? Quickly how the tables turned, it seems. You must have thought that Friday sealed your victory. But Sunday came and trampled on your schemes. And all you did was all you could, and yet it failed you. Because Jesus rose and sank you to the grave. And in resurrection I refuse to fear you. Oh, death, you died, and I'm alive instead. All you meant for evil, God destined for my good. Kill my body, you could, but still I live on forever. And when I should breathe no more, louder than I'll sing for, Death, you are the wide door to where I live on forever. And all you meant for evil, God destined for my good. Kill my body, you could, but still I live on forever. And when I should breathe no more, louder than I'll sing for. Death, you are the white door to where I live on forever. In the presence of my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for the way that it is finished. Thank you, Jesus, for the way Thank you, Jesus, for the way of your salvation. Oh, Jesus, for your death, divine love. Great job, guys. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being with us. My name is Pastor Brent. If I haven't met you yet, happy Resurrection Day, Bridgeway. Today's our, uh, technically, our eighth anniversary. So that's exciting, right? <laughs> Eight years ago on Easter Sunday, we launched Bridgeway, and that's, uh, that's pretty crazy to, uh, to think about. And then last, this is our first Easter in this building, which is cool, because remember last year, some stuff happened. And... Uh, we didn't have Easter here. Um, so I'm really excited that you're here today. I'm, I'm thankful to see Shirley Conrad. I love you, Shirley. And we're so glad to have Shirley with us today. You know, uh, as a younger pastor, which I've only been a pastor for eight years, but still, I, I had less gray. I'd say I had less hair back then, but we all know that's not true. Uh, I used to get real nervous uh, around Easter time. Because I felt like there was this added pressure, you know, some people who don't normally go to church are going to be gathering that day, and Brent, you don't want to screw it up, and there's a lot of unnecessary pressure, which was dumb on my behalf when I look back on it, because the main attraction today isn't a crowd of people, the main attraction is Jesus, right? And, uh, but man, I would get like, I would get in my head a lot and get real nervous about it, and one thing that has helped me uh, in the coming years is just reflecting upon how Jesus dealt with large crowds because he did like the opposite of what I, I would think you would do. In fact, in, in one instance in the book of Matthew, Jesus, uh, he's teaching and it just gets a little crowded. More people keep showing up. And so they move outside and the crowds keep coming. And it says that there is a great multitude that have gathered to hear Jesus Jesus teach. 
And so uh, you'd think, okay, he's going to get up, and there's going to be this massive uh, uh, teaching laid out for everyone. He gets up, and he says, a farmer got some seed, and uh, he went to go sow, it, sow the seed. And he threw some, and it fell on a path. And the path was really, really hard, and some birds came and ate all the seeds. So he got the seed, and then he cast it on some stony ground, and the plant started to grow. But when the sun got real you know, hot and everything during the day, uh, it died. Then he got some seed, and he threw it on some ground, and it grew, but so did the thorns, and the thorns eventually choked out the seed. But then he got some, and he threw it on good ground, and there was a yield of some 30 and 60 and 100 fold. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. See you later. And that was it. He's like, all right, there's my uh, lesson for today. And uh, I'll see you guys later. The multitude's just kind of like, oh, okay. So his disciples come to him after that. And they're like, what was that all about? And Jesus explains it in Matthew 13 in your Bibles. If you would open that up. Joe, go ahead and bring up Matthew 13, please. Then the disciples came up and asked him, why are you speaking to them in parables? He answered, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That is why I speak to them in parables, because looking, they do not see, and hearing, they do not listen or understand. Did you guys get that? Jesus is just like, I talked in a way where um, not all of them would get it on purpose. Wait, what? Because I'm thinking when I talk to a large crowd, I want to make sure everybody understands what's going on. Why is Jesus doing this? He's teaching in parables. Parable literally means to come alongside. And a parable is supposed to be paired with an explanation. And Jesus gives them the story, but he doesn't give the crowd the explanation. The reason he does this is, one, it, the, the story would become clear to those who were actually seeking him. Because when these multitudes would come, not everybody cared so much about Jesus as much as they cared about what Jesus had to offer them. So it wasn't Jesus they cared that much about, but what can he do to, to make everything easier for me? And so Jesus is like, I'm going to give them the story, but they're not getting the explanation unless they want it. So he's teaching in parables to kind of spike their curiosity, to, to whet their appetite. And those who wanted to know would come and they would ask. And that's exactly what the disciples do. They come and they ask. They want to know an explanation. And so Jesus gives them one. He says, okay. The uh, first soil, the hard ground, it's there's some seed thrown. That those people, they don't want what I have to say. It's just thrown out, it's gone, and they're like, I don't want any of this. I'm good, no thank you. Maybe, maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here because someone invited you, which is awesome. Maybe they promised you lunch. Hold them to it. They better buy some lunch. But you're like, I don't do this Jesus stuff. Maybe uh, the, 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 the rocky ground. Jesus is like, well, the rocky ground... This person accepts what I have to say, but when the sun comes out, when, when trials show up, they didn't actually believe this. They're like, okay, I got Jesus, but why are things going wrong in my life? This God must not be a true God. He must not actually care about what's going on in my life. You know what? Screw it. I'm done with this Christianity stuff. I'm, I'm done. I'm walking away from that. Because if, if God loved me, none of these bad things would be taking place. The others, you know, the, 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 the seed's thrown and the thorns start growing. He said, basically, those people have put me on the same pedestal with everything else in their life. Jesus is as important to them as comfort, as money, as success. And that's not how it works. Jesus is like, I'm, I'm above all of that. So eventually, those weeds, they choke out the plant. But then there are some that when the, the seed is cast... They're ready to receive it, and they do, and there's evidence of it. So my, my goal today, my hope today, is to simply just cast some seed out to everyone in this room and everyone who's watching online. I think 
all four soils are probably represented in this room and in people's living rooms right now. And if you say, well, I'm, I'm one of those soils that's not good, it doesn't have to stay that way. My prayer for you here in a moment is going to be that the, the, the hardness of your heart, the soil of your heart will be cultivated today. And that you'll be ready to receive what God has to offer you. So let's, let's pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into this truth I want to share with you today. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to stand, stand up here and proclaim your gospel. Lord, we're, we're here because we're celebrating the most important event in human history, the resurrection of Christ. God, there are many soils represented in this room, and I pray for those who maybe uh, have a, a hard soil for, for whatever reason. Maybe they have some, some history with church, and it's been a painful experience. And maybe that's re- I pray, God, that there's some soil broken up today and ready to receive what you have to, to share with them. Let those who have ears to hear, let them hear, God. Let them understand and let them accept what it is you're saying to them today. I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. So simply put, I just want to share some truth with you. And I want to ask you a question of how bad do you want the truth? Because often our belief systems are are not so much based on truth, but on desire, what I want out of this life. And people incorporate that with God. Some, some believe that God's sole purpose for, for, being, you know, for his being is to make sure that we're happy. And they'll justify things going on in their life that maybe God would not approve, and they'll say, well, God wants me to be happy. But that's not God's ultimate goal for us. It's not happiness, it's holiness. It's to follow him, to live for him. And sometimes that means there's going to be sacrifice involved. How bad do you want truth? Sometimes telling people the truth is hard but necessary. I think of, uh, you guys remember when American Idol came out in like 2002? I think it was 2002. I just graduated high school. That was a long time ago. You guys remember think about that? And it's almost 20 years ago. I just, that just dawned on me. Wow. Uh, the, the draw of American Idol wasn't the good singers, right? It was always these people who sound like they were, like you took a cat and put its tail on a meat grinder. It just sounded awful, right? That was a horrible example, Brent. Uh, <laughs> why, did, why did you say, forget the cat thing. Let's keep, let's keep moving. But they would get up to sing, and they would just sound completely awful. And, of course, Simon would tell them, you know, how horrible they were, and then they would freak out. And why is it? It's because no one told them the truth. They're not a good singer. They would get up and be like, but my mom says I'm the greatest singer in the world. Your mom's wrong, man. You're awful. Go be good at something else in life. But people need to hear the truth, and it can be painful to tell them, but it's necessary. If you love someone, you tell them the truth. I just want to tell you the truth today. And maybe... You're thinking, I, maybe you don't want to hear it. Or maybe that soil is hard. Uh, I want to quote the truth from probably someone who at one time was the hardest soil you could think of. And if you're not familiar with who Paul is in the Bible, before he was called Paul, he was called Saul. And he was not a good guy. Because maybe you're thinking, well, Brian, I've done some really horrible stuff. I I don't <laughs> I don't think God could forgive me. Well, let's start with this guy Saul and what God did with him. So in Acts chapter 7, you have the first Christian martyr. His name's Stephen. He was a deacon in the church. They kill this guy. They take his bloody clothes and they lay them at the feet of this young man named Saul. Why? Saul hated not just Jesus. He hated everyone who would follow Jesus. He'd have them arrested, imprisoned, and some, they would be killed. So they take the bloody clothes of Stephen, they lay it at the feet. When you get to chapter 8 in the book of Acts, it says that this guy Saul wreaked havoc of the church. His sole purpose was to make their lives a living hell. And so he tried. By the time you get to Acts chapter 9, this hardened soil meets Jesus. And it's tilled up, and that seed is planted. He accepts it. 
that he follows Jesus. In fact, he would go on to say that everything else in his life is but, he says, dung. He says it's a manure pile in comparison to knowing Jesus. What a change, right? I mean, talk about two different sides there. So when I, I'm about to read this in 1 Corinthians 15, we're reading one of the earliest accounts of the gospel. Paul's giving a testimony of what happened to him. This is within two years of the resurrection of Jesus. So he's writing to the church at Corinth, and for context, the church at Corinth is having a, an argument about the resurrection of the dead, and so uh, the Apostle Paul wants to take him all the way back to Jesus and explain some things to them. If you'd like to know more about the rest of that, you can read chapter 15, but I'm just going to focus on the first eight verses. He says this. He says, Now I want to make clear to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you, if you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you, as most important, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some, some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared, uh, last of all, as to one born at a wrong time, he appeared to me. So he just says, hey, let's get back. Let's, let me just talk to you about the basics of what's going on here. The gospel is good news. Why? Because we're sinners separated from God. I mean, this universe is, is, it operates with a series of laws. Well, whenever there's a law, there's a lawgiver. I believe that's God Almighty. God has a way in which we're supposed to operate in this world. And should we choose not to operate how he designed it, then we call that sin. So let's try to answer the question. Uh, in verse 3, it says that Jesus died for our sins. Why would Jesus need to die for my sin? Because you have a debt to pay, and you cannot pay it yourself. Anytime there's a breaking of the law, there's a penalty. Maybe you're thinking, well, Brent, I'm a pretty good person. I, mean, I haven't done anything that would, would keep me from going to heaven and if I, often folks will tell me, you know, if I, I talk about you know, whether you're a good person or not, they, I don't know why they start with this, but they'll say, well, I've never murdered anybody. It's like, congratulations. You're not going to be on an episode of Dateline. That's awesome. Have you ever hated anyone? Because Jesus calls that murder. Jesus said, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever lied? you ever stolen? And we can go down the list. The truth of the matter is, for all of sin and come short of God's glory, everybody's guilty myself included. In fact, the Bible says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. How can I, a dead man, make myself alive? I can't. And if you're thinking, well, I can just do enough good works and God will be like, he'll just take the scales and he'll just measure them out. That's not how it works. If that's how it would work, then why would we need Jesus to begin with if we could just work our way to heaven? Scripture says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we could work our way to heaven, we would brag about it. And there we would be sinning. So, no, Jesus had to come and Jesus had to die for my sin because he lived a perfect and holy life. And the only way for God's justice to be satisfied was for a perfect sacrifice. It's foreshadowed in the Old Testament when they would sacrifice a lamb. And here we have Jesus, the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist says who will take away the sins of the world. And so he dies on the cross, and he speaks the most powerful word in human history. Look at it in John 19. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. I say word because I know there's three words there, but Jesus didn't speak English. He spoke Greek. And the word there is tetelestai. And there's something incredibly interesting about this word tetelestai. First, when Jesus was uttering that, nobody knew what he was talking about. His followers believed that Jesus wouldn't be killed. That he would essentially kick the Romans out and set the kingdom up. 
That's why many are scattered and going their own way. Even though Jesus told them this would happen. So when he says, Tetelestai uh, has five different meanings, depending on the context of when it's said or used. And Jesus wraps them all up in the one. Tetelestai could be used if you were an employee or a servant at that time and you were given a job to do. When you finish that job, you would go to your boss and you would say, Tetelestai, the job is finished. It's done. If it was also used as a legal term for judges, if you had paid for your crime, the judge would stamp on your documents to telesty, which meant justice served. It's, it's done. Justice has been served. It was also an accounting term that if you had a debt or you had a loan, uh, when that loan was paid off, it would be stamped on your document to telesty. In fact, they have thousands of documents from the Roman period with that very word on loan documents to telesty, which means paid in full. Also, it can, in the context of an artist finishing a painting, when the last brush stroke comes off the canvas to tell us die, it's, it's finished. And then finally, a Jewish priest would use it once the sacrifice has been made to tell us die. Sacrifice is complete. So when Jesus utters that word to tell us die, he is saying the job is done. Justice has been served, it's finished, it's paid in full, and the sacrifice is complete. Your sins can be forgiven by Christ because of his sacrifice. It's a beautiful thing. But here's the kicker. Jesus could have said to tell us all he wanted. If he doesn't rise from the dead, then that word would have meant nothing. It would have meant nothing because he said they would kill him and he would come back. He said, if you destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. And they're like, you're crazy. And they didn't understand what he was talking about. He's talking about his body. If he doesn't resurrect, he could have said that as much as he wants. He would have been a liar. So when we get to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul continues. He's, he died for our sins. But it, the gospel doesn't end there. He said that he was buried in verse 4, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he keeps going, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. So he's basically saying, hey, some of these people are alive. Go talk to them if you don't believe me. They were there. They saw Jesus. It's not some fairy tale we're making up where we want to keep a close circle on who knows what. Go search it out for yourself. Then he appeared to James. He mentions James specifically, Jesus' half-brother, who did not believe his, his brother was the Messiah during Jesus' ministry. So Jesus is healing people, doing incredible feats, raises Lazarus from the dead, and James still doesn't believe. Why on earth would he believe after the fact? Probably because he saw that his brother resurrected from the dead. That's the only plausible explanation for the change in James. He saw something that changed everything for him. Paul says in verse 8, Last of all, as one born at the wrong time, he appeared to me. This hardened soil this one-time hater of Jesus, who you would think, there's no hope for this guy. There's always hope. He said, I deliver to you what I first received. Jesus died for me, and he resurrected. So I want to give you truth. But for me as a Christian, truth is wrapped up in a person. Jesus. He even goes so far as to call himself the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So all I can do today, standing before you and for those watching at home, is cast some seeds out. Some are going to fall on hard ground. 
some stony, some thorns, some good ground. And I want you to accept it. Well, what work do I need to do? You don't need to do anything. The work's been complete. Just repent and believe the gospel. Repentance basically is, is saying you're in agreement with God about your life and about your sin. God, I've lived this way, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you now. I'm turning from this way, and I'm, I'm following you. I'm putting my faith, my trust, my hope in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. So call out to him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, forgiven, born again. And if you meet him here, you meet him in the life that is to come. As Oren Lutzer put it, he said, Death is not the end of the road. It is only a bend in the road. The road winds only through those paths through which Christ himself has gone. This travel agent does not expect us to discover the trail for ourselves. Often we say that Christ will meet us on the other side. That is true, of course, but misleading. Let us never forget that he walks with us on this side of the curtain and then guides us through the opening. We will meet him there because we met him here. And the opposite is true. If you did not meet him here, you will not meet him there. And the Bible calls that separation after we die, it calls it hell. The second death. And God doesn't want that for us. That's why Jesus came. It's good news. I'm a sinner. I'm not up here to say I'm, say I'm better than anybody else. I'm a sinner that has been saved by God's grace. I'm a beggar telling other beggars where to find the bread. And it's Jesus. Let's bow together today. I thank you for your time for your attention. We call this time in our service an invitation because what we do is we extend just that, an invitation. If the, the soil of your heart has been tilled up and you're like, you know, Brent, I know I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm separated from God, and I need God's forgiveness. And I, I want to follow him with my life. Well, Call out to him. Whoever calls on his name will be saved. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So this morning, pray. It's not so much the words it is as it is the attitude of your heart at this moment. Pray. Say, you know, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm separated from you. I know that my ways are not pleasing to you. And so today, I turn from that. I turn from the old life. Today I ask you to forgive me. I believe that Christ died for me to pay for my sin so I could be pardoned. The fine has been paid. I just, I got to accept this gift, the pardon. So today I accept it. And from this day forward, I live for you, my Lord, my God, and my Savior. If that's you today, and you called out to the Lord, I want to rejoice with you couple things I want to ask you to do. The first thing, you got a communication card. Let us know you made that decision. You accepted that free gift. Just put your name and just mark that on the communication card. I decided to follow Jesus today. And then put it in the offering box and we would love to follow up with you and celebrate with you. But also, if you're in this room and you just gave your, your life, your everything to Christ, no one's looking around. This is going to take some courage. I just want you to, to look at me on the count of three. Just catch my eyes. Just me and you. One, two, three. Anyone like that this morning? Thank you. Thank you. It's the beginning of an amazing journey. An incredible one. Please fill that card out if you looked at me, and uh, I'd love to follow up with you today. To tell us, die. Lord, that word is uttered the most important time in our history and one of the darkest moments in our history. It's finished. And we can believe that today because Jesus resurrected. God, many soils are represented in this room and some watching online. 
for the soil that may be hard or rocky or full of thorns. We pray, God, for your spirit to till them up. For those of us who have accepted, may we yield some 30, 60, 100, and be fruitful in the life that you've given us to live for you. And for those who just accepted it, we look forward to seeing them grow in their newfound faith. We love you today, Lord. We thank you so much, not just for the cross, but for the empty tomb. I pray in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and we'll sing before we're dismissed today. have a wonderful Easter. Remember downstairs, family portraits if you'd like to grab Lamb Free. Hallelujah.